our welcome all of our online uh, viewers who are tuning in this morning, joining us uh, from wherever you are at home, and we're glad that you chose to be a part of our worship and message time today. Thank you for being with us, and for those of you who are here in person, it's always good to see you, and, and uh, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the second chapter of Exodus, second book in the Old Testament, chapter 2. And for those of you that are at home tuning in, uh, I do encourage you to join us on the YouVersion Bible app. We set that up each week so that you can have the same outline that we have in our bulletin. And we'll have all the scriptures that will be on the screen behind me that uh, many of you at home are not able to see. But it will be the same scriptures that we'll put up here for those who are attending in person to see. So the YouVersion Bible app under the Events tab Search for First Christian Church of Seminole, and you'll be right there with us today as we talk about wilderness school. Now, if you think back, I bet you can think of a time when maybe you didn't like school as a young person. Or, uh, you know, maybe for you it was uh, during one of those transition periods when you went from, maybe you really liked elementary school. I mean, who didn't like kindergarten with its nap times and uh, milk breaks and all that kind of stuff. And maybe you, you did enjoy going through uh, elementary school, but then you had to make that transition from elementary school to junior high school and all that that involved. And, and then maybe, you know, you got to the point where you're an eighth grader and you were at the top of the food chain in middle school, but then you had to transition to high school and you became from, you went from the top of the food chain to a nobody freshman. And maybe that was a difficult transition for you. Or maybe the, the difficulty or, or what made you not like school is maybe there was a, a move involved. When I was in third grade, our family moved and I had to start attending a new school. Excuse me, it was in the middle of my fourth grade year. And that was a difficult adjustment. I was leaving all of my friends that I'd grown up with since kindergarten and now I was moving to a new school in the middle of the year where I didn't know anybody. I didn't like it. In fact, we lived close enough to the school that during the lunch hour, I could walk home and have lunch and then come back. The trouble is, I didn't like it, so I would walk home for lunch and not come back uh, for a few days until uh, they caught on to that and my mother was contacted and that was taken care of. But maybe there was a transition like that for you. You moved to a new place and had to get readjusted and you just didn't like that. Or maybe you didn't like school because of the curriculum involved. Maybe you got to the point of geometry and boy, those angles and all of that just didn't make sense to you. Or, or algebra threw you for a loop because they changed the numbers to letters and that didn't make any sense. Or chemistry maybe was a real struggle for you. When we were kids, we didn't go to school by choice most of the time. We went because we were made to go. Well, sometimes God sends us to school against our will. And that's especially true when he sends us to what I'm calling wilderness school. In Exodus chapter 2, we have Moses who has now uh, become aware that it is God's will that Israel be delivered from their slavery and oppression in Egypt. But Moses early on had the idea that it was up to him to deliver the Israelites by his own ingenuity and in his own timing. And his own plans ended up failing miserably in the first part of chapter 2. We're going to pick up the story in verse 16 of chapter 2 of Exodus where it says, now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? He asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom saying, I've become an alien in a foreign land. 
During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now, as you read the end of chapter 2, it becomes clear that God is, God is about to move. He wasn't ready to move earlier in the chapter when Moses sort of acted on his own and in his own timing. But now that God's concern has been verbalized, you know what's coming. God is about to move against the evil empire of Egypt. Now remember back in the 70s, George Lucas produced that Star Wars trilogy, the first three episodes. And remember how Luke Skywalker, that impetuous young man, wanted just to go take on the evil empire all by himself. But the word came back, you haven't had your training. Don't go against the empire until you've completed your training. Well, something like that is going on now in Exodus chapter 2. Moses didn't realize when he fled to the wilderness of Midian that he was actually entering God's classroom. Now, when you went off to college, if, if that was the case for you, there was probably on your college campus a building that was perhaps the hub of the campus. And on that building over the archway, etched in stone, there was a motto or a theme that uh, described or symbolized what that university stood for. Well, in the wilderness school, there's a motto, there's an archway that leads to the desert sand that you must pass under. And here's what it says. The wilderness motto says, those whom God assigns, he refines. Those God assigns, he refines. God, in other words, has to do a work in us before he will do a work through us. And his favorite place to do his refining work is what we call wilderness school. In fact, years later, God will say to the nation of Israel, who themselves spent time in the wilderness, he will say to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert those 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. God makes no apology about it. I sent you to the desert, he says to his people, to give you a test. I sent you to the desert to go to school. And anybody that's ever been used mightily by God has spent time in God's wilderness school. I mean, look through the Bible and you will find Joseph spent time in the wilderness school. Isaiah and Jeremiah spent time there. David spent a long time in the wilderness before he ever became king of Israel. John the Baptist knew all about the wilderness so did Jesus. See, the wilderness is a place you would not choose to go. It's a place you're made to go. And the wilderness can look different in, in a variety of ways. Some of you are in the wilderness right now. Right now you're in a time of, of dryness or a time of testing or a time of really difficult circumstances in your life. You didn't choose to be where you are. You've heard the expression, no pain, no gain, and that's the motto for a lot of people's life. I like the motto, no pain, no pain, <laughs> better myself, but that's not God's philosophy. God's philosophy is if there's no refining, then there's no assigning. I'm not going to give you an important, significant, major role until you submit to my refining work. In fact, it's kind of interesting. The Hebrew word for desert comes from the same Hebrew root, root word that means to speak. So the desert is a place where God speaks. The wilderness is where God communicates to you some of his most important messages. And this morning, those of you who have been to the wilderness 
and are now on the other side can maybe look back and say, you know, God taught me some things. God helped me see some things that I, when I was in the wilderness that I'm not sure I would have ever learned if he hadn't sent me there. See, it often takes the wilderness school curriculum to produce in us a teachable spirit. That's why I've always liked what David said in Psalm 119. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. And then a few verses later in verse 71, he says, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. You see, pain gave David a teachable spirit. He said later, I know, O Lord, that your laws are righteous and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. When Cromwell became prime minister of England, they had a problem. There wasn't enough metal to uh, sufficiently mint coinage to keep the economy propped up. So he sent his servants throughout the countryside to take whatever metal they could find in order to make more coins. Well, they came back and said to him, you know, we're, we're just uh, all out of luck finding metal. All we can find is the statues of the saints in the cathedrals. And Cromwell said, good, let's melt down the saints and put them in circulation. And I suggest to you this morning, that's exactly what the wilderness is for. Now, if you go to wilderness school, there might be a lot of optional courses that God may have intended for you that perhaps he didn't plan for me. But I'm going to show you four courses that are required courses in wilderness school that God will send you to so that he can assign you something great for him. Course number one is what I call Handling Humbling 101. Exodus chapter 2 is the account of one of the greatest riches to rags stories of all time. I mean, you talk about a career shift. Moses went from prince of Egypt to nobody shepherd. Imagine some trader perhaps doing business with Pharaoh in Egypt and then transversing back through the desert and stumbling upon Moses there in Midian, knowing Moses' true identity and trying to imagine how he ever got from there to here. I mean, Moses went from heads of state to heads of sheep. He went from who's who to who's he. And you know something I've learned? God rarely trusts a person with notoriety until they prove they can handle obscurity. In fact, I read a college roommate of Max Lucado respond to someone's question as to why he thought God had so blessed Max Lucado's ministry. And the former college roommate said, I think it's because Max was just as happy as an obscure missionary in Brazil as he is today, perhaps the best known Christian author in America. He proved faithful in absolute obscurity. Now, I don't know if God has ever made you to this point take that test or not, but it's a required course. In fact, the, the Brahmin of India never stooped to do menial work. So you can imagine how shocked one professor in economics was when he got back to London with his PhD in economics. And he went to see Gandhi, who was the prime minister in India and, and at his retreat center. And Gandhi had a habit that whenever you came to work for him, he would give you a task. And so this noted, educated professor from the London School of Finance and Economics came to work for Gandhi. And Gandhi said, I, I want to give you a job. I want you to clean all the toilets here in the retreat center. And the man replied, I hold a doctorate degree. I'm capable of doing much greater things. Why do you waste my talents cleaning toilets? And Gandhi responded, Oh, I know of your capacity to do great things, but I have yet to discover your capacity to do little things. I've learned that God's people will either know humility or they will know humiliation. And the smaller we are, the more room God has to work. 
And by the way, I think Moses was out there in the wilderness where he was away from all the applause of men for the first time in his life, I might add. Because all, all the way up to this point in his life, for the first 40 years of his life, everything Moses did as the prince of Egypt was applauded and extolled and praised. But now for the first time in absolute obscurity, he performs his daily tasks with nobody around to tell him how great he was or how good of a job he was doing. And so I think it's there in the wilderness school, in the desert of Midian, that Moses learned to stand alone and not need the applause of men. And that's going to be a very, very important lesson for Moses going forward. Handling humbling 101. It's a required course. And there's another course that's required in wilderness school. It's called Facing Failing 201. Anybody here today ever wish you could go back and do something over in your life? Anybody ever wish you had a mulligan? Just, just another chance to get something right that maybe you didn't do exactly like you should have. Have you ever spent seconds or minutes or hours or days thinking of something or several somethings in your life you wish you could, back, could go back and have another stab at? Moses, most of us have like Moses' corpses that we've tried to bury in the sand, like Moses did with that Egyptian that he kills back in chapter 1, or earlier in chapter 2, excuse me. And I think that that hiding instinct is probably the most significant trait we inherited from our great-great-great-great-grandfather, Adam. I mean, just like Adam, who when he sinned, the first thing he did was to go hide from God. We're just like that. But Moses learned that trying to hide our failures does not erase our failures. How much better off would we be if we would just confess our failures to God and have God teach us what we need to learn from it? See, Moses learned from his failure. He learned the hard way that you can't do something for God and leave God out of his own will. He never made that mistake again, Moses. And how many of us, I wonder, though, have been skipping that class, facing failing 201? You know what we ought to do sometime is, is just have a, a testimony time where everybody can share what God's been doing in their life. But you know, most times when churches or organizations or programs have those times of testimony, they, they always hear stories from people who've, ex, who've succeeded in life, who, who've done great things and been blessed mightily because they've been faithful to God. Have you ever been a part of a testimony service that focused on everybody's failures? We ought to try that sometime. Have a time of sharing our testimonies where you can't give a testimony unless you're going to talk about how you failed at some point. And you confess your failure and say, yeah, I know what it's like to blow it big time. I, I did this, and, and, but I think God wanted me to learn from that. And this is what I learned. Now, now, here's something significant. Moses would fail again in his attempt to do God's will, but he would never try to cover it up again. That's an important course, facing failing 201. But if you pass that course, then you're going to take seeking serving 301. I said a couple of weeks ago how the Egyptians considered working with animals to be sort of beneath them, particularly shepherding. Joseph said to his brothers back in the book of Genesis, hey guys, the, listen, shepherds are considered detestable to the Egyptians. So when the Pharaoh asks you what you do, tell him, you know, something else. So what does God do when he sends Moses to wilderness school? He gives him a new career for the next 40 years doing what all of his life up to that point he was told he was too good to do. Now you may have great dreams of what you want to do for God. But you may be too big right where you are for God to do that through you. 
If you're too big to do something small for God, you're way too small for God to do something big through you. There was a, an article a number of years ago in Time Magazine about a doctor who lived in Hiroshima and he was practicing medicine right at the end of World War II. And one day, a mile away from that atomic explosion that, that totally wiped out his city, he said he was standing behind a corner of a concrete building and for some reason, the impact from that explosion that basically blew away the entire city left him unsinged and unhurt. Imagine what that scene must have looked like. All around him suddenly screams of people in agony. He was stunned and they asked him, well, what did you do? He said, for a moment, I didn't know what to do. There was so much pain out there. But then I opened my bag and I started to help the person closest to me. And I think that's good advice. The Bible says that the greatness in the kingdom of God is reserved for those who take the path of downward mobility. The greatest are those who are willing to become the least. I'm going to show you a verse of scripture. It's an amazing verse because next to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is describing the greatest leader the world has ever known. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, the Bible says Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And I would suggest to you that Moses learned humility in wilderness school. You know, most world leaders, let's be honest, most world leaders are rather full of themselves. But God's curriculum produces leaders who are empty of themselves because they're taking Seeking Serving 301 and have passed that test. And then there's one more course. It's called Willing Waiting 401. And I'm sure in those 40 years in Midian, Moses kept in touch with how things were going back in Egypt as traders would pass through the lands going from east to west. Moses would perhaps catch them and water their livestock at this well or as they brought back things from Egypt on their way. No doubt Moses heard many, many times how things were going back in Egypt. No doubt he had heard reports about how bad things were for his people. But he discovered already the hard way that you don't do great things for God in your own time. You have to do God's will in God's time. And so in the wilderness, we learn that God's track is more important than the fast track. The great evangelist Dwight Moody said, for the first 40 years of his life, <clears throat> Moses thought he was somebody. For the next 40 years of his life, the years spent in wilderness school, Moses learned he was a nobody. And the last 40 years of his life, Moses learned what God could do through a nobody. If God, if God is God, you've got to let him have permission to guide not only your steps, but your stops. You can't say, God, I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me, but I'm going to decide how fast we're moving along this path. Moses was going to be in wilderness school for the second 40 year span of his 120 year life. How many of us have been in the wilderness and we've pleaded with God to let us drop out of school before we learn the lessons that he intended for us? I mean, we've all done that. We get into a time of testing, we get into a time of trial and our, and our initial reaction is to ask God to take it away. God, get me out of this circumstance. Help this to just go away and, and get me out of this pain that's come into my life. Rarely do we ever stop and pray, God, this is hard. Or God, this hurts. Or God, I don't want to be here, but keep me here until I learn what you sent me here to learn. Not God, get me out of school today, but keep me here as long as it takes 
Because the Bible says God can't refine your character if he gives you everything you want as soon as you want it. Look at Romans chapter 5 where the Bible says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. So let me ask you something. Would patience come in handy later in Moses' life? Absolutely. Listen to this quote from Catherine Marshall's book, Adventures in Prayer. She says, waiting seems to be kind of an acted out prayer that is required more often and honored more often than I can understand until I saw what remarkable faith muscles this act of waiting develops in our lives. For instance, it is true that waiting demands patience and persistence and trust and a spirit of expectancy, all the qualities that we are constantly asking God to give us. You know, that's just like us. We ask God to mold our character, make us more like Jesus, so God sends us to school. So we say, God, yeah, I really need to work on loving other people like Jesus loved me. Help me to be more loving. And so what does God do? He sends you a very unlovely person into your life so that you can practice on that person. And you say, God, get rid of that person. Man, they are really a downer. Or God, I, I really need to, to work on forgiveness. I hold on to things much too long and I, I just really need to learn to forgive others. And God sends someone into your life who wrongs you and you say, God, I hate that. And I'm never going to forget that. God, mold my character and build my faith. And so God puts you in the midst of a test that takes a, a long time to bring to conclusion. James says, you've heard about Job's patience and you know the Lord's purpose for him in the end. You know the Lord is full of mercy and is kind. Because God had a purpose for Job. Job's time in the wilderness was not in vain. And God doesn't send you and me into the wilderness to punish us. He sends us into the wilderness to prepare us for the wonderful purposes he has planned for you and me to fulfill. Which leads me right into what I want to close with this morning. When you graduate eventually from the wilderness school, there are two things that will always happen. Number one, wilderness graduates can look ahead and anticipate a special assignment from God. I want you to believe that today with all your heart, that if God has placed you in wilderness school, God is not going to waste that experience. It was too precious. He will bring you to a burning bush moment and will say to you, oh, look, that was just preparation. Now I'm ready to use you. And when you have the opportunity, you will then be able to use the lessons you learned in the wilderness. Which explains, for example, that verse in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 1 where it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. See, you were in the wilderness. You needed comfort. God gave it to you. Why? Why? Not just to comfort you, but so that in the future, when you came across other hurting people, you could then comfort them with the comfort you received in wilderness school. So God comes to you in the midst of your pain, not just to bring you comfort, but to equip you to be his instrument in somebody else's wilderness school. God wants you to be someone's tutor, someone's teacher. And share with them what you learned. He doesn't send you into the wilderness for retirement. But for reconditioning. And wilderness graduates can look ahead and anticipate a special assignment from God. I'll tell you what else wilderness graduates can look do. do and that is look back and appreciate how God has prepared them for his call. I mean, did Moses' time in the wilderness 
prepare him for God's call later in life? Absolutely. And as you think about the rest of his life, were the virtues of patience and service and total dependence upon God, were those things going to come in handy in the last 40 years of his life? You bet they will. But Moses did not know at the time what God was doing. You see, when you're in the wilderness, you don't always see yet how God is going to use this experience. But later, you can look back and say, thank you, God. Now I know why I had to go to wilderness school. Moses had a son while he was in the wilderness. The Bible says he named him Gershom, which means I've become an alien in a foreign land. I think that's one of the reasons Moses had to go to wilderness school. You remember when he came out to the well, one of the uh, daughters of Ruel said to her father, an Egyptian saved us. Moses didn't even look like a Hebrew. Everything about Moses reeked Egyptian. But in the next 40 years in the wilderness, God taught Moses what it was like to feel like an alien in a strange place. And the Moses that then goes back to Egypt to deliver Israel is a different deliverer than the Moses who tried the first time. And I hope you can look back one day and see how God has used circumstances that you never would have chosen yourself to prepare you for opportunities that you could never have imagined. If there's any lesson we can learn from wilderness school, it's this. Don't waste a good hurt. Don't waste it. You can pray for comfort. You can pray for God to heal you or to, to get you through it. But above all, let's pray for God to end your schooling in his time, not ours. Don't waste a good hurt. Be sure you learn what God wants you to learn. Because I'll tell you something, if you don't, He'll send you right back to school. I love this poem. I'm not sure who uh, is the author of it. But it goes like this. When, Ma when God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed, watch God's methods. Watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers and hurts him with mighty blows, converts him into trialed shapes of clay, which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying and he lifts his beseeching hands, how God bends but never breaks when his good will he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. Those God assigns, he always refines. Now I want to close where I started. How do you feel about school? <laughs> because some of you are in wilderness school right now. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you will be going to wilderness school soon. Some of you have left the wilderness, but maybe you didn't learn what God intended for you there. Some of you, thank God, have been to school, made it through, and you've looked back and thanked God for allowing you to have that experience. That's what pleases the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, be joyful always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So that's what we're going to do today as we close. We're going to thank the Lord for making us go to school. If you're in the wilderness right now, I don't have to encourage you to pray. You're already familiar with prayer. If you've been to the wilderness, maybe today you can look back and thank God for it. So we're going to take a moment to do that right now. And I want you to bow your head. And I want you just to thank God for sending you to school. Whether that's something that's in the past or something you're in the midst of right now. And even you don't understand it completely. But do it in obedience. Even if you don't feel like thanking God, obey scripture and thank him for caring enough about you to want to refine you 
for his purposes. Let's do that as we pray. Father, today we have to confess before you that your ways are not our ways. Your ways are above our ways. There are things uh, about you that we still struggle to understand. Things about how you work in our lives that don't always make sense to us. There's a way that seems right to us, but in the end, like your word says, it pretty much always leads to death leads to death of dreams and death of plans and, and death of futures. But when we lean upon you and trust you with all of our heart and ask you to guide and direct our steps, regardless of how long that's going to take or what the process involves, Father, there's always life and joy and ministry to others awaiting us on the other side. So Father, help us even when it's the most difficult to do so to thank you for those wilderness experiences that teach us about humility, teach us about not being too big to be used by you, but humbling ourselves to a place where you can use us most effectively. And Father, most of all, help us to be willing to do your will, your way, and in your time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We hope those of you tuning in online will have a blessed week and uh, be encouraged by the message today. We're going to continue our study of Moses. We're doing it here on Wednesday night as well. And then next Sunday, we'll pick up where we leave off on Wednesday. I hope you'll be able to join us then. For now, God bless you and thank you for joining us.